Hey everyone, Brian Beeler coming to you with another Storage View podcast live in San Jose, California at the uh, Vast Data, well not quite their complex, but we, we were working with them on a, a, the latest launch and talking with a lot of their partners. Uh, here we've got Greg Matson from Solidime, who has a great experience in NAND storage. So we're going to get into all of that and uh, presumably much more. Thanks for coming over and being live in person. This is exciting. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and saying that I know more than I probably do. Uh, so I run basically product strategy, uh, product marketing, technical marketing, and you know essentially define all the products and sell all the products that are on our data center room. So would you consider yourself a sales guy or geek guy? Uh, definitely not sales guy. Although <laughs> I, I come in, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like the bridge, yeah. you know, so I, I uh, our team defines every SSD that we've made for years. All of our revenue for every SSD we've ever made comes from the team that I run uh, and, you know, direct the work of now over 2000 engineers. Wow. And so. That's impressive. Uh, it's 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 a fun job, and, and ha we've been able to grow. Or I've been part of it since it was you know hundreds of millions of dollars, and now we're you know five plus billion. Uh, I was really excited to see the you know the growth in revenue, but also now we're we're outside of Intel, and have much bigger plans than that. Hey, so you think this flash thing is going to catch on? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so. Well, so it's interesting. I mean, it's exciting, and, and you guys are, are so well positioned now to be flexible, I think, to deal with kind of a lot of these questions that are out there around form factor, around yeah. NAND types, around capacity points, just because we can make a 100 terabyte drive, do we, is there a demand for that? And then all the way down to the little things like boot drives. I mean, you cover the whole gamut of, of what's out there. We've been working with you guys a lot lately on, on QLC, and I think that's one of the really exciting uh, potential spots where you know, we just did a project with the uh, 30 terabyte 5316s and a data logger for autonomous vehicles. I mean, I, I, I don't think many could have envisioned a use case like that uh, for QLC, you know, even two years ago. It's really rapidly come along. Yeah. What's, uh, so let's kind of work through some of the portfolio, but start with the QLC. So what's, what's the latest you know, learning there over the last, I guess, maybe year or so of selling that drive? Yeah, I mean, we launched our, that's our, kind of our second generation QLC technology. We've been in production with QLC since, gosh, was it 2016, 2017 type timeframe on our 64 layer products. And then, as you know, for about a year on our 144 layer uh, QLC products. And uh, shipping them in, in high volume to hyperscalers, uh, to customers like, you know, Vast today, you mentioned, you know, we're here supporting the launch of their new system. And um, see adoption growing quickly. Now, it takes a long time for industry adoption to happen. And there's software changes that you need to make in some cases to use the different types of performance that come out of QLC. Um, but we see, Customers, you know, again, from hyperscalers to storage innovators to traditional uh, storage OEMs, you know, really looking at adopting QLC in a big way. Well, I mean, the, the neat thing, and you talk about interacting with it the right way. I mean, early on, the, the concerns were all about endurance, right? Or at least that was the uh, industry fear or mm -hmm. real or, or otherwise manufactured by perhaps NAM vendors that couldn't make QLC or weren't. So there's some of that in every uh, cycle of technology, right? Um, one of the things that I thought was really neat is when we were working on that data logger project, really understanding that the drives want to be written to in a block size that's, that's relevant to that particular build. In your case, it yeah. was 64K, I think. Yeah. Um, in a traditional drive, it might be 4K. But even... You know, even in a TLC drive, if you start writing one, two K blocks or smaller, I mean, it's it's highly inefficient, right? Yeah. And so at QLC, the bigger drive, the bigger capacity, it gets more important to tune the uh, the the workload to make sure that you're interacting with these drives the right way. I mean, what Vast is doing, from my perspective, from a software side, is really pretty sharp to be able to say, let's take this QLC, front end it with SCM but make sure that, that we're writing to this thing and reading to a certain extent in the ways that keep it happy and comfortable and get all the benefits of the capacity, cost optimizations, thermal, I mean, all these things. I mean, there's 
a lot of upside for those that can take advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you know, we've designed our drives to have that uh, big block in direction mm -hmm. and because uh, it reduces the cost fairly significantly. Uh, we do have plans to introduce 4K based drives. In fact, we're shipping mm -hmm. one 4K drive, but it's one SKU, so it's been, you know, the adoption has been limited. Uh, but there's not everyone who can t change their software. So at some point, you know, in the future, we'll How sit back. How dare you speak of hypervisors <laughs> in that way? <laughs> we'll sit down and talk about our 4K drives, but right now our 64K, give the best cost to performance value for our more sophisticated QLC customers or, or storage customers, whether it's in the cloud or like VAST to aggregate the rights and write sequentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do and can get TLC read performance out of the drive. And, uh, you know, able to extract the value of the data that are in those huge drives, you know, because the read performance is so high. Right. Um, but, you know, it takes a little bit of work to get there. And luckily they own their, their entire environment and can control Absolutely. everything that happens inside their, their compute box and their storage box. Well, I mean, there's a, we were talking uh, with NVIDIA too about the DPUs and, and the importance mm -hmm. that that plays in a box like this. But there has to be a certain will to like want to go out and make a fundamental change, and it seems like I mean they're your customers, so you don't have to talk about them. <laughs> but the just broadly speaking, the entrenched uh, storage appliance guys that haven't always been on the cusp of new technology. I mean they're typically a little more reserved, a little more conservative. But this like this kind of tech gives the the ones that are willing to go innovate and adopt that and and deploy that quite a bit of opportunity to stand out. Yeah. Yeah, I think you talk with, with Vast specifically, they talk a lot about the democratization of Flash, right? But it can't just be cheap. You know, right. QLC offers a, a le new level of affordability, but it has to be performant still, and it has to be reliable still. Mm -hmm. And luckily our drive does all three of those, I think better than most or all. Um, and, but, but, but because you know, there's inherent legacy of technologies that companies are, are comfortable with. Right. And, and, you know, I think you have to overcome all those barriers, you know, within a, a bigger company requires overcoming them with more people at that company and, and what the, and what their machine already does. Right. So it might be easier, you know, for a startup to kind of move quicker and show up how things should be done. And then, you know, I think that'll incentivize some of the traditional players to move. In fact, I know that it, right. it, it is now. So the vast box is interesting because it's one you. E1Ls uh, throughout yeah. the product you have. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Actually, before you get too far into it, talk to me about Ruler specifically and kind of what your viewpoint is now as Solidime going forward on E1S, E1L. Uh, first, we're, we're, we're very committed to kind of four main EDS FF form factors. E1S, E1L, E3S, and, and later E3L. Okay. We see those as kind of the four that I think will get mainstream adoption in different types of market segments. So in uh, U.S. cloud, for example, we're seeing a lot of adoption from uh, you know the big guys on E1L for storage and E1S for compute, and, and in some cases storage workloads, depending on how they wanted to design their system. Mm -hmm. And so, and they love one U servers, and. Uh, now, it's because those guys aren't very strong. They can't carry the two you yeah, around. Yeah. Well, you got to keep them very small. It might be <laughs> just because of that, or or I, what I really think it is 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 the modularity and the scalability of all those oh, that systems. That might be it, right. right. <laughs> so, that might be it. But um, but then you know traditional enterprise server, you know they they like two you, and and so do uh, CSPs in China, for example. There are two you kind of bought in, and so the, that is where the E three form factor. It feels uh, looks like to be the what's going to happen. The next case. step for U two U dot two U dot three maybe migrating into this uh, this E three. It's uh, rectangular, right? So it's familiar. Yeah. Are you having to do on the on E one S and L multiple heat sink sizes? How are you adjusting to to that? Because I know on E one S there's five different uh, uh, Z heights in the spec, right? Yeah. Yeah, there are, you know, kind of depends on the thermals and the power that you're, you know, and the performance you want to get out of the drive. Uh, we're, we're not doing all five. I can't remember which three we're doing. But it's not the 5.9, I can tell you that. The, uh, <laughs> so, the, the naked one, yes. Right, right. Um, 
We see a lot of adoption, you know, it, but again, it's, it depends on the, I think 15 millimeter is really the one that seems to be the center of the universe. It there. feels the easiest, right? Yeah. Because then we're still comfortable with 24 drives across the front of a server and yeah. the, the capabilities there. It's interesting that you brought up um, uh, some of the feeling on 2U in, uh, in Asia. We just got a, um, a Inspur server and our build didn't have it, but it was a, a 24 bay 2U hard drive system in the front. And around the back, they've got a little flex block there that you can put, I think additional hard drives or SSDs, uh, RZ2, SATA2, NVMe, or you can get a little bank of E1S in the back and that's really cool because now we can take, I think it fits six or eight or, or something in the back, couple that with the massive capacity in the front, and, and now you've got some really interesting potential if you're not in this position where you can go all flash. And of course, right. you know, we know that's the direction, but that's still not all the workloads, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're, well, you're, you're aware. Hard drives aren't going away. Right? <laughs> it's not going to go away in my career horizon. It's just we hope it gets pushed further down the stack. And, sure. And there's plenty of room for, for hard drives and flash to play you know, forever, I mean, with the amount of data being generated. Um, you know, putting the E1Ss in the back of a server pains me is, is, is you know, the, kind of the genesis of the, what was called the Intel ruler at the time right. came from my team. And, uh, you know, we, we like, we had this, after really partnering with the industry and getting a lot of inputs uh, from competitors, from system builders, from, you know, in customers, Serviceability is like a big deal. Yeah, I know. And you know, so, so putting those drives way back there I kind know. of like makes me a little sad. It, it may not be <laughs> ideal, but it's interesting because we're seeing so many more opportunities. Lenovo's got a, a server um, that has, uh, I think, 16 of them in the front or something. But it's coming, and, yeah. and the server guys have got this great opportunity now just looking at form factor, forgetting about even PCIe 5, 6, all the stuff that's coming. Uh, to do you know, tremendous new designs. So what they do with it, we'll see, right? But, but they've got a lot of opportunity being enabled by, uh, much of it by flash storage to, to capture that. Yeah. So when you look at uh, E1S and E1L for now, what, where do you see the differences? And then maybe let's talk a little bit more about the long ruler specifically in the vast scenario. But where do you see the two of those shaking out from a solid time perspective? Uh, we have a full portfolio of both. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that for the most part, you'll see that E1Ss are going to be TLC based, kind of compute oriented, you know, higher performance, dent, you know, dense compute type systems adopting them. Um, OCP customers, for example, mm -hmm. are all moving in that direction. Um, right. or, or adopters of OCP, you know, uh, chassis. Uh, E1Ls, you know, again, I think for those very high capacity storage systems that don't just want capacity to scale, they want IOPS to scale with it. Right? With it. Um, and then even, you know, we go Gen 4 to Gen 5 to Gen 6. You can do memory expansion with CXL. We can put GPU on it for CXL or computational storage. And, uh, you know, I think that either of those form factors can support a lot of different flexibilities you know, of memory types and storage types over time. But, you know, I think you ask, where do I see it going? Near term, compute, TLC, UNSs, and uh, high capacity QLC, UNLs. And so what does that mean in terms of capacity? It feels like the UNSs are a pretty popular band. It's probably like the eight terabyte, the seven, six, eights right now. Um, you can probably make them larger. Maybe you do. I just, uh, I don't know. Do you make a larger one than that? In the E1S? No. Right now we're kind of in the uh, 192, 384, 768 type range. Uh, you know, a lot of them are still being used or you know, still being used. They just got adopted. But there's some Gen 3 designs where, you know, the two terabyte might be a, a popular mm. capacity point because you're getting a certain amount of performance and it's in a certain system with a certain core count. Uh, that goes to four terabyte at Gen four, and you know, you know, between four and eight terabyte at Gen five are kind of the sweet spots for mm -hmm. E1S that we see. And then on the E1L, so you're getting much more yep. PCB space to work with. Yep. 
Uh, what are you looking at there in terms of capacities? Our product line today has 15 and 30 terabytes. Mm -hmm. We have double and quadruple those capacities on our roadmap out in the future. And we'll launch those products, you know, in the not so near, you know, the, 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 the next, you know, the doubling in size, right. not so far away. And even our vast friends said, hey, they're challenging the industry to get moving in that direction. They've challenged me. Go, to, to crank, go to crank out a 64 and a 128. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're, those are in our sights. Yeah, I mean, then you got to worry, though. What are your customers telling you about the, the data gravity or the, the data bomb that can happen if, if you lose you know, a one use system that holds a couple petabytes, the rebuilds? I mean, there's a lot of concern there, yeah. real or otherwise, <clears throat> about how much capacity do I really want in a single node? And it probably depends on the customer. Yeah. Uh, but just what, what's your sense of, of, of that at the moment? Well, that's interesting because they were, we were just talking about that in the, yeah. in the, in the launch room. Um, there is still that concern for sure. Now, Flash enables much faster rebuild. Sure. Uh, the, the reliability of Flash is incredible, to mm -hmm. be honest, in terms of failures, uh, very small numbers, way lower than the specs mm -hmm. are, are, are the failures. Well, I always knew you guys were goose in the <laughs> <laughs> um, But uh, not everyone's going to be able to even... A, afford or take advantage of the performance or, you know, even need, it's the need 32, thing, right? th 30 terabyte drives, mm -hmm. which is why we make 16s. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we see adoption for something lower, well, hey, that's not so hard to make. Um, just the people who are buying them today want 16s and 30s and are challenging us for higher. Right. Well, there's always going to be, you know, once you standardize on something that's large, like a 30.72 or whatever the, yep. four, the capacity is. Uh, of something like the 5316, you're using it, and you use it more, and then you figure out, okay, well, this is really great at all these other things. Let's, you know, bigger is, is maybe better in some of those use cases. When you're analyzing piles of, you know, genome sequencing data, trying to make a new drug or something, you know, I mean, yeah, there's piles of data. And, you know, the more it's, the more that's stored, the more you want to use it, which is why we like scaling the IOPS as well. Um, and it gets those data scientists kind of hooked, right, on the access to well, the data. Yeah, I mean, that's it's something we've been talking about a lot of no one deletes data anymore. Yeah. There, there was at one point a movement to do that. Uh, that's long gone. AI has really killed any momentum there was about ever removing anything. And the more data you have, the better you can model, the better your intelligence is, the more learnings that just it's all better, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't have these multi-petabyte data pools, data lakes on hard drives. It's just too hard to move it to where you need to do the analytics to get it into the, the GPUs, uh, the DGX systems, whatever it is. I mean, there, there's just too many challenges. Yeah, if you want to use the data, data on a hard drives, you know, is, I, I don't want to say dead, but it's close to. And now it needs to be there, right? And then maybe transferred to flash. For the, you know, for the workload. For yeah. a periodic workload, right? And yeah, you know, the IOPS per terabyte of hard drives has been the same for a long time and is not getting any better, maybe worse over time. Um, maybe slightly better, but can't keep up with the flash, you know, the PCI interfaces. And no, there's some, so tr there's some tricks like dual actuator or simplifying design with NVMe interfaces or whatever. But yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to be able to get to you know, thousands of megabytes per second. That's just not, uh, not realistic, right? Right. Right. And then the, I think the software ecosystem has to evolve with it. The compute power has to evolve with it because, you know, still those are bottlenecks, mm -hmm. other bottlenecks in the system that need to scale. You know, it's neat to have capacity, but if you can't use it because of something else, it's also dead and, mm -hmm. and worthless. So I think it'll take time and no one will scale at the same rate. You know, so that's why we have TLC. That's why we have QLC. That's why someday we'll have PLC. You know, for different you know, different workloads need different things. You guys have talked about that before, yeah. maybe earlier than, <laughs> in retrospect, than, than maybe you would have wanted to, but uh, five-level or penta-level cell technology, it's coming. I mean, it has it's, to come eventually. It's real and it's coming. How small do these things get the spacing between uh, electrons and, I mean... <laughs> I got a guy down in Santa Clara. You I can know, ask him. It's, <laughs> so, so. But it's insane to think about that, right? The the lithography, the engineering, the design that goes into that is just 
crazy. And the voltage thre- th- thresholds are, yeah. are exceptionally yeah. narrow. And but that's one of the advantages of floating gate because the cell isolation allows uh, more precise voltage placement. It you know prevents cell leakage and you know really has us as you know, that's why we're investing in that technology. It's it's for the multi-bit scaling for the cost efficient high capacity dies mm-hmm. um, and frankly the opposite is also true why we are happy to be merged now with sk who has uh you know charge strap tex- technology that mm-hmm. is fast and great at compute okay so we've we've talked a lot about qlc we've we've dabbled on tlc and well, we even i wasn't expecting to hit the plc but we even did that on the tlc front what are your customers demanding there? Because it seems to me that you've got some progressive um, uh, NAND changes, which have been going on in the in your 5000 series. We see that drive show up all the time in servers and storage arrays. I mean, it's a very well well respected uh, product. The capacity points still seem to be in that four or eight, or eight terabyte class, where there's a lot of interest and in, in demand in, in that size of a drive. Um, but SAS is still a thing. Are you? Are you? See, what do you see there in that in that high performance category? All the innovations on NVMe. Oof, yeah, right. and you know SAS will be there. Of course, twenty four gig. You know we've seen you know customers you know prepare for twenty four gig, uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's for kind of an evolution of their existing systems, not where they're investing their money on new systems. And so stretching current investments more than, right. yeah. Yeah, and you know, our, yeah, you're right, our 144 layer TLC products, the P5510 specifically is, it's two capacity points and it was done that way on purpose. It was to get broad adoption at the capacity points that a certain set of customers buy a lot of mm-hmm. and, uh, but we are coming out with, you know, additional TLC products in that product line here fairly soon, uh, with the broader set of capacity points. You know, as some customers want to go up, but some customers want to, you know, stay on the two terabyte, for example. And uh, so you'll see a broader product portfolio in that area. Well, yeah, I mean, you, if you look at the scatter plot of capacities to drive, I mean, the the bulk is kind of right here in the middle, right? As much fun as it is to have, you know, thirty terabyte in every. Thing you sell, right? It, it's the demand isn't necessarily there. Right. So, what do you see coming though in terms of what customers want? So, we're already getting whatever it is, seven thousand megabytes a second out of out of these TLC drives. Yeah. Uh, Gen PCIe Gen five is not so far away, and that gives. And you talk about CXL and some other things. There's a lot of potential for even more performance out of these drives. Is that the next big thing that your customers are asking for? Are there other capabilities that they want? Like what, what, looking down the road, do you have to do to continue to evolve these NVMe drives that are TLC to, to meet customer demand? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, you're right, a good question. We've got what's coming down the road and what's being digested still is what came down the road two years ago, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, today's shipments, we still have big CSPs across the globe who are shipping a lot of Gen 3 systems. Hmm. And so they're, you know, it's TLC, it's four terabyte shipping into Gen 3 products and, and really ramping and doing the transition to Gen 4 right now. They might have launched a service on Gen 4, but you know, it's taken a long time to transition to a high adoption rate of Gen 4. Uh, and then typically at that node change, they want IOPS to go up, you know, double-ish. They want capacity to go up, you know, and it kind of, it's all, all scales with core count uh, for compute and hosting type mm-hmm. workloads. Now, looking forward is Gen 5. You've seen some competitors announce Gen 5. We're, we haven't seen a whole lot of systems ship on Gen 5 yet. And, you know, we're, we're aiming ourselves at kind of when we think the, there's some level of significance in the volume of Gen 5 systems shipping. Look, we've got so. PC boards. <laughs> so. We've got PC boards with with up to two Gen 5 uh, edge card slots in them. So as long as right. as long as you, uh, you know you only want to sell two drives into a PC, you should be fine with that Gen 5 stuff. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean you're right. You've got to wait for the the enterprise infrastructure to be there. Yeah. Um 
there are certain workloads, of course, that will benefit from that increased yeah. speed. But to your point, I mean, you highlight a good, uh, a good bit of rationale there that, I don't know if most, but a giant bulk of workloads maybe don't even need to go that fast at, at a certain point. But, uh, you know, I, I yeah. don't know. Well, well uh, certainly a 2U system can't use 12 drives worth of Gen 4 IOPS. They couldn't use Gen 3 worth of IOPS. No, we talk about that all and, the time. And, uh, you know, but there are... Gen 5 is coming, right? We're going to see server designs. Now, a lot of them are going to be Gen 5 by 2, mm -hmm. but there are going to be also a lot of Gen 5 by 4. And, but, uh, you know, I think it'll be a slow transition, like any of them, but maybe slower uh, in, you know, 23, 24, 25. You know, I think really it's going to be late 24 before you see a lot of meaningful adoption of Gen 5. Seems right. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot, your storage guy, about what these faster protocols, interfaces, what, what they enable. And you highlight the performance in a, within a server. We can cap out two eighty three eighties today with four or five drives on, yeah. under certain scenarios. That's not hard. Um, and there's two things that I think that are really interesting that, that people should be thinking about. One's data transport. So, you know, that... We've talked a lot about DPUs with NVIDIA and uh, you know, Vast is using that technology to help get the so, so if we can hold a petabyte or more in a box, now how do we get it into the GPUs? How do we get it to applications or whatever else? So that's one thing. Yeah. The second thing that comes up a lot though, where there's some concern is heat and the thermals. And Flash is not immune to, to heat, obviously. You've got those big chunky heat sinks on, on the E1S and E1L products, because you need them. Yeah. Do you worry, how, or how much do you worry about thermals going forward as these drives do more and more and more? Do I worry about it? I'm not super worried about it in EDSF form, factor, form factors. Okay. You know, the U.2s were challenged from the beginning. You know, you get a get a bank of 12 or 24, you know, U.2s that are you know, max write workloads at 25 watts and you, you've got to have a whole lot of inner airflow, right? You're going to have a really loud fan. Um, the surface area of E1L being 75% more than U at two, the airflow being, you know, I, I don't, can't remember the metric, but something like 2x better. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the modularity and being able to have an, a high number of drives in the front, you know, in the front to back airflow, uh, allows you if you want to run your PCI Gen five drives at thirty five watts to get the maximum write performance. For example, you could design airflows in. You don't have to, you know, fill every single uh, one of those thirty two bays. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have every fourth be an airflow channel if you'd like. Um, so, do I worry about it? No, do we need to have a couple of different air, you know, heat sink types for different system configs? Yes. Right. And um, you know, now PCI Gen five and U.2, you know, people are talking about it. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why we think that might not be, you know, um, it, it, or it becomes a little bit scarier. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah. but we're seeing that, that kind of that transition time frame. A lot of people talking about moving to E3 or E1. Well, so that's why this is this form factor issue right now is interesting because when you going back in the history of the initial SSDs X twenty five and like all yep. these things going way back, um, the form factor at the time was uh, was forced upon you, right? Yes. You couldn't tell server vendors, you couldn't march in and, and tell Dell and HP and everyone else all these. SAS bays that you're used to that are 15 mil, you know, rectangles. How about you redesign all of that for flash? I mean, that would have never worked, right? Right. right. And so now you've got the opportunity with the rulers, with E3, um, to work with the server guys on this sort of inflection of technology. But um, how is that conversation going around form factor? Because there's still no one or two standards. I mean, you talked about four just in this yeah. conversation. Actually, yeah. if we count U2 and, and U.3, I mean, we're up to six in this conversation. Yeah. But it's sort of untenable long term, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it'll be, it's an interesting roadmap challenge that I have, right? Is how many do we build and how do you manage this transition? Because U.2 is not going away. 
Uh, now, whether it stays at Gen 4 over the long term and innovation starts at Gen 5 and beyond oh, uh, okay. for like the E3 form factors, for example, um, is TBD. Uh, but the ship has sailed on E1, E1 form factor designs. That's all it's going to be designed in. You know, I don't, I don't want to say all that's going to be designed, but it's a huge majority of designs for uh, U.S. cloud specifically. Right. Um, and then, yeah, how do we manage them? I'm not sure. You know, I think what we're getting is, you know, finally, it, it takes a long time. We had to ship, like you said, we had to ship Flash into the form factors that existed or we'd still be waiting mm -hmm. uh, to do it. I mean, I'll tell you, this e, this EDSFF thing took a long time. We, we, we had the Intel ruler. It's, it's been many like years. Like seven years, Yeah. right? And um, then we brought all the industry players together and partnered to create EDSFF. They all contributed and, and got, you know, got their design points in, and they're still just starting to design those into their system. So it takes, yeah, it'll be a decade before we're 100 percent EDSF if we ever get there. Well, that's why you know I, we we've talked a lot too about disruption from uh, in the storage array business. I mean, Flash was was fundamental to disruption there. Guys that exist now, like. Pure and others wouldn't exist without Flash, and they were in the early disruptor bucket, yeah. taking both uh, storage technologies for drives and data transport technologies, be it back in the day InfiniBand or even, I mean, back when 10 gig was kind of novel, right? Uh, 2540, like all these, uh, all these uh, interconnect, and now with the DPUs. The disruption potential is tremendous right at the moment. Yeah. But you have to be willing to go do it. We've talked about Vast. We're here for for them. I mean, they're certainly on that uh, on that path, no doubt. Um, but the other the other providers are really going to have to you know, look pretty hard at these technology shifts and figure out what to do, right? Because I don't think you can stay at the status quo for much longer and and miss out on this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think you'll see some innovate here soon. Um, you'll see it at the adoption of QLC. You'll see it at the adoption of ESFF. Uh, I think that now that some of the innovators are getting more real, uh, that they're starting to feel that, you know, that they need to, to, to make some bolder moves. And where before, you know, if you go back to the early days of AFAs, Okay, there was a lot of startups, and you could have a lot of IOPS in a box, and it sounded good, but there was no software ecosystem around them, and they all got bought by the big guys, and you know, you know, some of them made it, and the big guys not many. The big guys still adapted their system to use Flash, and they still sell them. Oh no yeah. doubt. <laughs> so, no doubt. Um, but I think you know, like today we're here at the Vast event. They've had tremendous success, much faster and more real success than most or all of their competitors. And, um, you know, I think that'll, you know, that success will drive change at, at traditional storage. Yeah, it has to, right? Yeah, um, yeah the, the disruption is real. Um, and, you know, again, everything that you guys are doing from a, from a drive standpoint is, is, you know, forcing that change. And QLC, I mean, for as much as the TLC drives are the, the, your high performance, your know, bread and butter, the QLC opportunity in the leadership that, that you guys have there. Maybe talk about that for a minute because there must have been a moment in time in the last three or four years where uh, Intel at the time decided we really want to be a leader and innovative in QLC because you guys kind of took off on your, not exactly on your own, but the leadership there is, is clear. I mean, we're not seeing a whole lot of QLC from anybody else, and I don't want you to, you know, have to worry about naming competitors or getting into any of that. But was there a fundamental decision, or when was that decision? Because it had to have existed where where you guys really said QLC is uh, is is going to be a, a massive, uh, you know, future looking item for us to to bring to market. Yeah, the decision was sooner than we might have wanted it to be, um, but it was because the technology worked. And well, that helps. you know, it was like, it was a little bit, I think in the background 
and then it was here, Greg. Here's QLC. Go ramp it, and uh, which was great because you know at the end of the day, for a lot of things in, in the memory business, cost wins, and it takes some time, but you know eventually, people really figure out how to use lower cost things, and um, but it can't be at the sacrifice of everything else. For sure. Um, so, but it was probably around when we launched our first. 64 layer product and I'm trying to remember the year it might have been 2017 20 late 16 no probably probably mid 17 mm -hmm. uh, we knew that we had a technology advantage and it was just how do we get there you know and ship our other you know you know stay in ship what's shipping and start transforming the industry um, at the same time, we were working on storage class memories, mm -hmm. and we do see in many cases, depending on the type of system, you know, you want a fast media, you want a slow media, um, they kind of go together, you know, for certain types of workloads, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so that that was kind of the Intel-based strategy, and now going forward, we're looking at, okay, all those medias can be flash. And whether it's TLC plus QLC or TLC plus later PLC or do we do something faster than TLC that's still TBD? Hmm. Um, and then, you know, long, you know, if you look out way out in time, you can think of, you can go much slower with PLC and go deeper into the cool segment, but also um, new types of memories are coming and you know, they'll be uh, perfectly they'll be perfectly mated with QLC and PLC. Don't start talking <laughs> holographic or <laughs> so, genetic. I can't I, I I you know first I don't I'm not the storage class memory person anymore and you know we're it's a whole new we're a flash company we sell flash but we make some pretty fast flash. <laughs> so, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, on the SEM uh, side, I mean this box in particular from Vast leverages SEM in the front for rights and, and, and hot activity and QLC in the back, which is which is interesting. Um, it's really QLC in the front. Just, uh, <laughs> so it's like... QLC in the front, <laughs> SEM in the back. Um, but it's it's interesting, and you're right, you're talking about different media in, in an ecosystem in a box in this case, but yeah. uh, there's all this disaggregation conversation about how you do these things. Um, what else are you excited about in terms of innovation and what else is coming down the road, whether it's you or your partners or other industry trends you think are, are compelling? Well, something I, I see at, you know, kind of starting at the big, you know, cloud storage specifically that uh, can be scaled down is the, with the advent of 100 gig, 200 gig, you know, uh, the essentially... A storage box can be, you know, remote accessed by multiple systems. At the box level, boy, it, it's hard to tell if it's TLC or QLC or even something else, right? You know, when it's in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we do see a big opportunity, you know, for cloud storage appliances to be all QLC and deliver the performance that's needed you know, across these high performance compute systems. And, you know, and compute flash being staying compute flash. And, you know, being high IOPS TLC type compute flash, but when they need much more than the cores can service right away, they're going to be, you know, very likely a lot of them will be a QLC. Well, that brings up another interesting point because in the hard drive world, you've got WD, you've got Seagate and, and Toshiba. And when one of them, Toshiba's catching up, but generally speaking, WD and Seagate, when they get a new capacity point, 20 terabytes, they're both there at about the same time both working dual actuator, they're both working new technologies like Hammer to be able to continue to increase their, their capacity. And one of the reasons that they both have to innovate so fast is that the typical enterprise procurement cycles are to multi-source components. Yeah. But when you've got something like a, uh, a 30 terabyte QLC drive that doesn't really exist, at least not in any quantity in the market, how does that shift how procurement works? Maybe the clouds are a little bit different, but you know, someone like Dell or HPE or Cisco, whatever, they, they really like to have two sources so that they're not reliant, right, on, on one. And we've already seen just in the last couple of weeks manufacturing problems with certain mm -hmm. hand providers that had mm -hmm. some contamination issues. And it's a real concern, right? How do you, do you get 
push back? I mean, there's nothing you can do. But Yeah, there's nothing we can do. I mean, we pride ourselves on invention and driving new technologies. And, you know, we, you know, so we're going to be first to new, I think, new layers of, of silicon technology being out there, you know, in that QLC or PLC or whatever you want to, you know, space. Now, you're right, some customers want to move faster than others and can move faster than others. Um, and some will wait until there's a second source. Uh, or they can use TLC as a second source. We have some customers doing that. Hmm. And um, whether it's value TLC or they beat them down on price or I, I don't know how they justify it, but you know, at the end of the day, if they've designed their server to or their, their storage box to work at a certain level of performance and it's around QLC level, well, TLC will fit in. Sure. And so it's not, they're not stranded on an island. Uh, they just might have, they might not, it might not be QLC replacing QLC. We've talked a lot about NVMe is clearly where all the innovation is, which is an interesting thing because I think something that most people probably don't remember, and I don't even know if you were there. Yeah, I guess you were. You've been doing this for some time. But when Intel started the, in, in Flash, the launch of an SSD was, I don't think it was controversial, but it was kind of weird back then for Intel to get into the storage business, right? And at the time, there was a relationship with HGST, if I recall, about how that business got kicked off. And Intel, more or less, I'll, I'll summarize and then let you <laughs> let you recharacterize. Yeah. But Intel, more or less, said, we'll take SATA and this NVMe thing no one's ever heard of. HGST, you can keep the SAS interface and plug along there. Yeah. And it looks like that was kind of the right call. At, at this point. Yeah, it was a matter of circumstance at the time, you know, about how much can you invest and where do your skill sets lie? You know, we're at Intel, we had a long history of SATA, invented SATA, uh, had invented and drove the adoption of PCIe, you know, PC, PCI yeah. Express into yeah, the CPU. Pre NVMe, right? Way pre NVMe. Right. And then NVMe, knowing what, you know, what was coming down the road. Um, so that's where we had our expertise. That's as much as we could invest. And, uh, but we also had this media that was great for uh, SaaS and for storage and wanted to, to serve our collective customer base you know, with a full product portfolio. And we were able to do that with a great partnership with HGST and later WD. Right. Uh, we had great success there for a lot of years and leveraged the strengths of both companies, right? The, the media development, media management that we had you know, back uh, you know, at the, in the Intel days, and then the the SaaS and storage expertise that that WD had, and you know, we made it rain for a long time <laughs> with that one. And you know, but it is now. It's time. It's you know, it's that's the, the innovation in both SATA and SaaS are are waning, and you know, the future's in VME, and that's where we're putting our wood. So, well, I leave it there. I think that was a, a good place to go out on and, yeah. uh, and a fun conversation. Appreciate you breaking free and spending some time with us. Well, thanks, Brian. I you know, appreciate the partnership and, and testing our drives and working with us to teach us how to test our drives and vice versa, right? Keep, keep sending them. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep uh, trying to break them. You know, because I do, one thing I, I really appreciate is the, hey, it's easy to buy a drive on Four Corners, but at the end of the day, you're never using a drive in any of the four corners performance areas, it's really these more sophisticated workloads. And it's what we pride ourselves in how we design our drives, is we take real customer workloads. We, it's all about the application, right? We write our, our code and our, you know, design the scale of our drives to, to be the best at those workloads. Mm -hmm. And I think we're pretty good at it. But it, you need somebody like you to be able to <laughs> showcase that performance. And so I appreciate it. We're glad to work with you. <laughs> love them individually, love them in systems. And uh, you know, I still haven't quite seen the, uh, the VAST server in, in per person yet. We're going to go see it this afternoon. So I'm really excited to see you know, how that's come together in, in your stuff there. And, uh, shoot a bunch of uh, video and, and see how it comes out. Well, that one's cool because, you know, I mean, VAST in particular, I know we're supposed to wrap up, but VAST in particular, <laughs> they came out, their early days presentations when they launched were like, oh, these guys, are, it's, our visions are aligned. Now, we could never create a storage system, but we had the building blocks to do it. Yeah. And now that they've adopted, you know, the E1L for their form factor for Flash is, you know, they're, they're singing our tune and they, they and we're seeing now that you know real systems come to market with the vision 
um, that we had for E1L and QLC. And so I, I'm, I'm stoked for Vast. I'm stoked for us because of the j joint success. And you know, we'll see how they, in a year, we'll look back and see what happens. Well, I'm going to see if we can't slide a couple of those drives into my backpack when we're overlooking at it uh, later today. <laughs> well, see if anyone you, notices. You've tested them before. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Greg, thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it.